Welcome to NCC Unplugged, the podcast from Norman Christian Church, where conversations, community, and culture converge. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of NCC Unplugged. I think it is about episode 22 or 23, which is exciting. We've been at this for so long. It's yeah. a lot of episodes it in is. a short amount of time. It is a lot of episodes. We're trying to bring one every single week, and so we're excited for our listeners to be on this journey with us. I don't know if journey is the right word, but we'll go with it for now. So we're excited you're joining us for another episode of NCC Plugged. I am joined to my left, Garrett Crawford, our Minister of Outreach and Small Groups. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> kind of my and Matt too. Mastriani, our uh, Director of Tech and Media. Hello, Jeff. And you uh, once again called it NCC Plugged. No, I didn't. I yeah, specifically did. said no. unplugged. You said right before you went to Garrett, you said plugged. We'll play it back, man. I <sighs> got you. Help me out. Help all me right, out. All right. Put in the comments if you heard that. <laughs> That's what people say in the YouTube videos all the time. I don't know why I tend to say plugged sometimes it's, rather it's than fun. unplugged. No big deal. Plugged wouldn't be as fun as unplugged. Because we're plugged yeah. in right now yeah. with all the wires that are around. Yeah, we are. Yeah, Think about it. But it's you know it's something fun that I watch for now. See if you uh, <laughs> misspeak so good or there, not. Philippa. You were. But anyway, well, our topic of conversation today, and the reason that I've asked both of you to be here, is AI or artificial intelligence. Uh oh. And so we've talked about it uh, in the church office a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's AI. Kind of the, this generation of AI has been out maybe for. A year or so? Yeah, just over a year. Like yeah. ChatGPT, I think, was the first to really open the doors of kind of this artificial intelligence technology, and mm-hmm. it's grown in a lot of different ways and scary ways as we see, oh, this picture isn't even a real picture. It's AI picture. Yes. Um, and so we sometimes talk about, about it around the office and finally decided to sit down and talk about it over a podcast. And so, um, Garrett, I think you're going to start us off, right? Uh, well, I think more specifically, like we'll talk about how AI plays a role and what theologically what we call the Imago Dei or the image of God. Mm-hmm. So as humans, we are created to be God's image bearers. And the role of AI and the role of technology, there's a huge um, debate now, or not debate, but there's just a lot of discussion on what role does all this play in our understanding of who we are as God's image bearers? Mm -hmm. So how does technology affect what it means to be made and exist in the image of God? Right. Um, Yeah. And that's, that's a good reminder. I mean, this podcast isn't just about um, coming up with better pictures or or changing, you know, how we write a, a, a term paper. We want to take a step back and not say, how do we do it, but should we do this? Mm-hmm. Right, right. And I think it's important, too, before we even get into the discussion, to to realize and recognize that there are different forms of AI out there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, I think it's important as we talk about it to um, talk about the specific types of AI that are concerning to people or yeah, whatnot. Yeah, so, so as the tech director, yes. I mean, this is probably be your world more than most of us. So right, right. what is out there when it comes to different types of and- AI? How much do you use AI on I'm a regular basis? I'm not going to uh, share that information. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if, if you look back just briefly, like, you know, before chat GPT became a thing and kind of like blew up the whole AI atmosphere, if you will, um, we have been using AI forever. Chat GPT mm. is called generative AI, which means you put something in and it generates something for mm. you. And there's a lot like of... Like something new yes, that some, hasn't existed before. Yes, it, it can. It can. Okay. Um, it or, can? Like it can create something out of thin air or it only takes what we've created and... That's what I was going to say, but there's there's different types. So like okay. Chat GPT, if you tell it to make a specific quote from somebody that like never existed, it will do it. Wow. There is a program out there called Perplexity that it will only give you the information if it's sourced. So Mm -hmm. if it was actually written or said or something. um, How does it determine like what sources it uses? Yeah, well, it gives you all the sources up at the top whenever it generates it. And then I think that's where you use you yeah. know, our, our God-given knowledge and abilities to say this is a good one or a so bad one. From an, not to deter, but from like yeah. an academic perspective, like when I'm grading papers for mm-hmm. my like 
undergraduate students, I can always tell, not always, but it's pretty clear if they are citing AI sources because a lot of times the sources don't match up the quotes they're pulling from. Right. So I like they'll give a quote and then cite the source, and I know that that quote is from a different source. Something, yeah. And yeah. so like, how accurate is something that's driven to be sourced mm -hmm. material compared to like Chat GPT? Yeah, yeah. So, so could I go back? Real quick before answering yeah, that question. Yeah, yeah no, no worries. Because I, I, again, do think it's important to look at the different types of AI. You know, if you watch Netflix, if you watch Hulu, Amazon, there's AI running in the background all the time. Mm -hmm. Whenever yeah. it's saying like, hey, we think you might like this next, you know, the next series or next TV show based on what you're already watching, that's AI. Um you know, whenever you're typing an email and it wants to finish the sentence for you mm. or you're starting to type in the email and it autofills the email address because it already knows you used it before, that's AI. Uh, playing video games, you know, me and my son play hockey games and we'll play against the computer sometimes. And I always remember uh, every year that a new hockey game would come out for PlayStation they, you know, in the updates and everything is like smarter AI to interact, you know, how a real human would um, based on what your movements are in the video game. So, I mean, let's go further back because yeah, yeah. we're saying some of this is just basic, a basic computer program. Right. Going all the way back, mm -hmm. it was Blades of Steel the first hockey game? Blades of Steel. It was not Shing. the first hockey game. Blades of Steel. Swing. Yeah. yeah. So it was not, but yeah. So even in that yeah. original Nintendo yep. days back in the eighties, would yep. we consider that AI? Uh, yeah. So yeah. you're playing mm. against a com a computer program, right. a Nintendo program. Yep. So they've gotten better and better over the mm -hmm. years. Now we're 2024, have really advanced in video games, and you're yeah. saying like on the phone as it finishes your text message, mm -hmm. all that stuff is considered AI. So there's right. a lot of different things. Right. So why do you think? the discussion surrounding AI has exploded all of a sudden if it's been around that yeah, long. Yeah, yeah. I think because of the scariness of the generative AI. Because mm -hmm. um, like the, the one software I was talking about, Perplexity, I look at that as a search engine on steroids, essentially. It's not creating new things. It can, but it's using what's already mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. Where ChatGPT is just like, boom, here you go. Um, mm -hmm. There's several um, art, programs and softwares out there that are it's wild we're like just over a year into this and you can create any photo that mm -hmm. you want um you type in a couple i was showing a customer at my shop one day and he was like what's with this ai stuff so i was like here check this out i was like give me some words and he's like a cow surfing wearing a top hat I was like, do you want it to look like a cartoon or like an actual photo? He's yeah. like, oh, an actual photo. Typed it in. Boom. There you go. Wow. Generated it. But what they have now, and this is just shows how quickly this is moving um, and what the the pros and cons of it are, because there definitely are issues. I, I'm, I'm one for being able to use AI with limits. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's very important. But now with this software, you can actually animate the AI created image that you made. Mm -hmm. um, so I had it make a bird for me and then I told it to animate it by flapping its wings and this mm. still image that never existed before flapping its wings. Wow. Like, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's what I think people are very afraid of is the speed in which it's being rolled out and mm. developed mm. and just, you know, the, I, I think ultimately they're worried about, and I, I forget what the the certain type of AI it is called right now, but it's uh, where it becomes sentient. It becomes right. feeling. Self-thinking. Self, self yeah, yeah. 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah. You know, I can't do that. Yeah, I mean, that that's how, been our yeah. movies for, for a long time. Right, that, right. You know, machines are going to come over. Matrix. Yeah. Take us over when they start learning things. So as Christians... We want to have a biblical worldview of these things. I mean, there's there's a worldly view that says, well, is it is it good or bad for the world? Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's some good, there's some bad, pros, negatives, all that stuff. But Garrett, bring us into the realm of biblically thinking through some of these things with a biblical worldview, you know, not just would God approve of this, but how mm -hmm. do we live out? You started talking a little bit about our, our God-given identity with something that's now a computer given identity yeah. so a lot of I, I think one of the best resources that has just recently come out I, I don't know the date maybe 2017 maybe a little later 
is a book called Transhumanism and the Image of God, Today's Technology and the Future of Christian Discipleship, and it's written by uh, Jacob Schatzer. And he really, what he does, <clears throat> he dives into explaining, first of all, what transhumanism and posthumanism is. And so what it is, is um, just to go off his definition, transhumanism transforms. So at a basic level, the transhumanist movement seeks to improve hu human intelligence, physical strength, and the five senses by technological means. Mm -hmm. So the transhumanism movement, and there's like a, this whole website and um, organization dedicated to it that originated in, in the 90s. Um, their goal is um, bettering humanity by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. So the ultimate good is that we become better. For them, morality isn't black and white. It mm -hmm. morality is whatever makes us better, and so technology, in their view, doesn't necessarily need parameters as long as it makes us faster, stronger, smarter, look however we want. Like it's good. Mm -hmm. um, that's transhumanism. Posthumanism is through transhumanism, through improving ourselves by whatever means necessary, we are eventually become something other than homo sapien, other than human, um, something beyond what we currently are. Mm -hmm. um, so they go hand in hand. Posthumanism is the result of constant transhumanism. And their argument is that we've always been using technology to shape us. So from the invent of the first farming tool, all of a sudden, we're now being shaped by that farming tool. Um, from the advent of the first knife, we're we're now being shaped to think in terms of weaponry. Mm -hmm. um, and so technology, whatever it, it might be, whether it's computer technology or farming technology or weaponry, or um, it shapes who we are. Mm -hmm. we, we were a hunter and gathering society because we knew how to make knives and baskets. Mm -hmm. And so that shaped who we are because that was the technology that we had. Do you think to a lesser extent or maybe equal like medicines would be under that same thing? Yeah. Because if we don't have the medicines, then our bodies are just yeah. naturally yeah. decaying, but yeah. we're prolonging our lives in some cases well, with medicines. Think and about um, how many vaccines have eradicated like polio right. and, and other things like that. We are where we were once shaped as a society by some of these major diseases and illnesses. We no longer are, mm -hmm. and that's due to technology. So, is that fall under posthumanism or not? Really, it falls under transhumanism. transhumanism that we're sorry. Yeah. getting better and better. Okay, um, and and so the the point of the transhumanist is that technology has always shaped human identity. Okay. And so we shouldn't be fearful of that taking place now, even with more evolved technology. That at one point, the you know the plow was something foreign to humanity, mm -hmm. and maybe at that time they thought, "Oh, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. This is you know, we, right. this mm -hmm. is shaping us the wrong way. It's making us lazy, or something." I don't know. Um, that's the transhumanist argument. The argument from which which Jacob Schatzer in his book points out is if the goal of the transhumanist is to become something other than human, then the goal is to become something that does not seek to glorify God. It seeks to glorify humanity. Mm -hmm. okay. And so if we use technology to exalt self, then we're just returning to what took place in the fall of humanity. We're returning to this goal what tempted Adam and Eve wasn't a fruit that looked tasty. It mm -hmm. was this awareness that they thought they would be on level playing field with God. Yeah, to have the knowledge. Yeah. Good and evil, yeah. So the goal of the transhumanist is to get to this post-humanist spot where we are in control of our own glory, of our own destiny, of our own identity, which means we aren't submissive mm -hmm. to being made in the image of God, we are just the image of ourself. And that, you know, mm -hmm. as Schatzer points out, is what the fall is is um, built upon. So the question we have to ask with technology, with AI, and he goes into a lot of different types of technology, not just AI, but 
if we're talking about AI specifically, does it, is it on a trajectory to make us, to pull us away from what it means to be God's image bearers and pull us closer to a focus on human identity for the sake of our own glory? And so that yeah, would be yeah. like where the conversation. There's different sides of that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. even within yeah, you know, and I Christian think that, circles. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question to ask too, because how far back do you like we were just talking yeah. about? How far back do you go and say this is okay, but this isn't? So I, I think it has to do with the the, the heart too. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's you know when it's it's interesting in doing some research for this topic and everything. And I'm going to use the church as a whole, not Norwin Christian Church, but the church as a whole. Throughout history, whenever there was something new that comes on the scene, there was always pushback, fear, and a little bit of trepidation from the church in mm -hmm. the church response. Mm -hmm. uh, when the printing press first became a thing, it was like, no, this is bad. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're losing the personal touch of uh, We recording. can't put hands in the Bible or Bibles in the hands of people that don't know how to read it. Yeah, yeah. It's dangerous. Yeah, there's yeah. always, and, and I think as we look through just the our, our world and the timeline, I think there's always going to be new things that are always used for good or evil. And I think it's up to the church to kind of find that that lane where we need to operate within AI is out of the box. It's, you know, yeah. especially with chat and how many softwares there are, it's never going back. Yeah. Like it's here and it's only going to get, you know, more and more powerful, which is again, the, to the bigger conversation. So from the technological standpoint, yeah. what would your Christian perspective mm -hmm. be on ensuring that we remain rooted in the Mago day without just saying, throw away AI because it's just not possible in right. the culture that we're in right. yeah. unless we all become Amish. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it, my personal belief is I'm fine with using AI to improve or make, let me think how I want to say this, to improve something that has already been done by man, Okay, if that makes sense. So Jeff, yeah. ask you a question. Uh -huh. Have you used AI to write your sermons? I have not. You have not. Okay. But you use AI sometimes or have you? I I do. Uh -huh. I've I've had an account. Um I've used it like you used the words earlier before like a a, a search on steroids. Mm -hmm. I've used it for that. Okay. Um I know there's a time in the sermon where I, there's a quote or hey I know a guy that like I think of C.S. Lewis, I know C.S. Lewis has spoken on this topic before, so I will go into ChatGPT and say, find me a quote from C.S. Lewis about so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, Google can do that too, but I found it just very, very difficult. You have to wade through a lot of different websites. This website lists 50 top quotes from C.S. Lewis. None of them are on the topic that I'm thinking of. I, like it's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't find it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I've used it for that before. I've used it for um, trying to reword things. Yep. And to say, here's my here's my sentence. Improve this sentence. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's just so long because um, we're talking about five things, and I'm trying to summarize the sermon in one sentence, and I just can't. And so I'll try to get it to summarize it. I've I've probably. I've probably been disappointed more times than not right, um, right. using it and like, oh, I thought this would be easier. Uh -huh. um, in fact, so here's something I did right before the podcast. Um, I typed into chat GPT. I said, should I use you to write a sermon? <laughs> chat GPT said, using me to help craft a sermon could be quite beneficial. It helps generate ideas, provide relevant, it went through a few things. Mm -hmm. And then I said, and I don't, I don't, I don't like correcting chat GPT because I feel like it's going to come back at me at some point. Like <laughs> It's going to come for the ones that weren't nice. Like you always say thank you to. Yeah. You're like, I'm saying thank you to a computer. Uh, but I did. I corrected it. I said, I didn't ask if I could. I asked if I should. And so chat GPT said, ah, I got it. Whether you should use me to write a sermon ultimately depends on your own beliefs, values, and preferences. Mm. And so then it went on to say a few other things because it can be quite wordy. Mm -hmm. Um you know, going back to what, what Garrett has said about the Imago Day and and not just that, but thinking 
my sermons are based on the Word of God. Sure. And the Word of God needs to be handled um, carefully mm-hmm. um, and with reverence. And so um, 2 Timothy 3, um, 16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training righteousness, so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, talks, scripture talks about rightly dividing the Word of God and being able to to know what it says and what it means by what it says. And so I take that serious and I don't want it to be lost in, in me, quote unquote, writing a sermon. Because even saying that, writing a sermon with ChatGPT, I'm not writing anything. I'm just plugging in, hey, write a sermon on forgiveness. And it'll come up with three points and mm-hmm. different things. And I've done that for the fun of it. Um, it you, you can, it's one of those things you can tell. Yeah. I, I can't, I don't, know how to define how to tell whether a sermon's been done by chat GPT, but it's one of those things when you see it, you know mm-hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's just big flowery words and just, it's like it loses, it loses its soul in a yeah. sense. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't want to get overly, you know, Christian with these words of like, but, but it is like that sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that comes down to our definition of Imago Dei. So, and just to clarify, that comes from the Latin um, image, imago, dei, God, and mm-hmm. it's uh, in the genitive, so it's image of God. Um, if you look at the basis for this theological statement, it's from Genesis 1, 26 and 27, which says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And then if you go to verse 28, it says God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. And that's kind of the basis of what's called, a couple other big words, the ontological and the teleological nature of the image of God. So ontological is the nature of being. Mm -hmm. So who we are in essence. Teleological is the nature of purpose, what we are to do, what's, what's the reason for our existence. So ontologically, our being exists to bear God's glory. Mm -hmm. So we are to bear the glory of God by being made in his image. Now, it's pretty straightforward. It says, God said, let us. And there's some people that say, well, he's talking to the angels at this point. And so that's why it says, let us. But the angels don't create. You know, mm-hmm. Angelic beings don't create. So he's not mm-hmm. talking. He's This is a Trinitarian going back to the opening verses of Genesis and using John's... Um, John's interpretation and in his mm-hmm. prologue of his gospel, he's speaking to the Godhead. Let us make man in our image. So Father, what's, Son, Holy yeah, Spirit. Father, Son, Spirit. What's the essence of that image that we are made in? It's relational. Mm-hmm. We're created to be in this relational society, which is why he's created us male and female, and why when you go into the zoomed in picture in chapter two, there's this picture of man cleaving to his wife and and you have this representation of God's image in relation so ontologically we bear God's glory in relation to one another teleologically our purpose is to bear that glory to the world mm-hmm. to show who God is mm-hmm. to the world and in the perfect design that was to the creatures that moved on the ground the the livestock the the birds of the sea, we were to roll over God's creation as his emissaries, as Mm -hmm. his um, namesake. Um, Now, in the corruption, in the fall, instead of rolling over the world in God's namesake, we did it for our namesake. And Mm -hmm. so very early on, you have all of these, like if you look at the... the, um, like the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Enuma Eilish and all these early Sumerian texts, very quickly you realize that humanity is 
glorifying themselves. Mm-hmm. Like well, even in the Tower of Babel, yeah. yeah, we get the example of you know they're doing this so they can be on par with God. Yeah, with it, right. yeah. The Tower of Babel wasn't a skyscraper; it was a ziggurat. It was a temple, mm-hmm. and it was built to the glory of humanity to be on par with the glory of God. Mm-hmm. To reach into the heavens is a metaphorical statement of we're trying to put ourselves in the heavens with God. We're on this similar yeah. line. So already we've corrupted this image. So what does it mean to craft sermons, to use AI for this purpose? It means that if we are using it for the sake of accomplishing a task, mm-hmm. a helper, almost, a, yeah. a helper, yeah. Yeah. then we're missing what it means to be relational. Okay. Um, so I, I get the, the sense of we're using it to maybe enhance or clarify or or fill in some gaps of some things that we have in our mind. But if we're doing it, if I... It, so I use it to write my abstracts for my papers. I'll write my paper and then I'll put it through chat GPT and say, can you synthesize this in a 200-word abstract for me? Mm-hmm. And then I'll, you know, change some things. Um I would never say, can you write this paper for me? Mm-hmm. Because that takes the, like you said, the soul out of it. What's the soul? The soul's relational. Mm-hmm. And if I'm right, if I'm just writing a paper for the sake of writing a paper, mm-hmm. it does, has no teleological value right. because it's not relational. It's not endowed in this, in this relational aspect, especially in a sermon. I mean, you are not just preaching what's on paper, you're preaching and guiding and being relational to those mm-hmm. To whom you're giving this yeah, message, absolutely. and so if AI is doing it, it misses that. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I've I've heard a lot about too is outside of the church, people that aren't happy with AI because it is taking away that relational aspect of think about like a, a famous painter, right? Mm-hmm. Like they put their blood, sweat, and tears into these paintings yeah. and their their God given talent and ability, and now it's just being replaced by a computer. You know, there's no emotion behind it. There's no, you know, for the Mona Lisa, like, what were they thinking? What was he thinking whenever painting this? And, you Mm -hmm. know, it's just like I inputted this prompt and here you go. Um, Same thing, music, music writing. There's there's a website where you can type in, write me a song about this and put it to the tune of this and it will generate the music like the actual music that you hear, wow. the lyrics, every like it will generate everything. Yeah. But like you said, how you're using Chat GPT for your abstracts, like you're using something that you already created, mm-hmm. right? And then you're asking for, you know, narrow it down or a little bit of help and yeah. everything. So to go back to your original question that I said I wasn't gonna answer, yeah. you know, like how do I use AI here in the church? Um, a lot of the times for the uh, sermon titles that we put on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll take the transcript of what Jeff already preached. He came up with by himself, you know, with Mm -hmm. help from from resources and everything. Um, And then I'll ask, take that and make a description from it. So it's not, you know, it's not taking something that a computer made then doing that. It's, It's taking something that, you know, a person that put in the the time and, and the thought and the energy mm. to create. Um, there's there's several other pieces and some things I, I classify as AI. Some things I don't classify yeah. as AI. Um, but it goes beyond just AI. This question, any so like from going back to this transhumanism mm-hmm. um, uh, movement, any technology that betters humanity, whether it's AI. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's cybernetics, um, cosmetic surgeries is one that they are very uh, much an advocate for. Right. Anything that, in their view, betters the human condition, prolongs, strengthens, gives more mental capacity, mm-hmm. is a good thing. Because in their mind, the um, what is good is that humanity becomes better. Mm -hmm. But that definition doesn't have any bearing on relationality. It's the individual human becomes more exalted. So if you like go away from AI for a second and you say, um, I can't remember what he calls, what morphological freedom is, Mm -hmm. is the term, which is the freedom 
to change my body, morph, morph mm-hmm. my body. That's mm-hmm. Latin. Um, and the transhumanist view, that should be the case. I should be free to make myself whatever I want to be. Well, what happens if everyone has access to make themselves who they want to be? Will there be diversity mm-hmm. anymore? Or will we say, well, this is the pinnacle of beauty and everyone just makes themselves that way. Everyone looks the same. Mm-hmm. Well, now we've taken diversity out, which is something that is a integral part of what it means to be in God's image, that we are this picture of the infinite character and nature of God mm-hmm. and the fact that we're diverse as humans. We take that out through morphological freedom. That's just one other way that technology can sever what it means to be God's image bearers. So I guess personally, where do you draw the line then? And that's, you know, I've not, I don't think I've, I've studied this enough theologically to know a line needs to be drawn, mm-hmm. but I've not thought about it enough personally to know where to my line where is. Fall, right? Because yeah. like you said, I, I see AI and, and technology. Like I, I'm probably not as good with technology as the average person my okay. age is. Like I'm kind of an old man, um, but I do use technology. I, mm-hmm. you know, I have, um, I use Chat GPT for my abstracts. I'll, um, you know, I engage with another one that that he brought up in his book is augmented reality, yep. which goes beyond just like the MetaQuest VR goggles. But mm-hmm. any video game you play, that's augmented reality. Mm-hmm. That's you engaging with. Um, a world that's outside of this world. Right. Um, and and the argument of the transhumanist is that the, w- especially in today's culture where we're swiping all the time, where we're looking at a video game screen all the time, the more you do that, the more that augmented reality f- affects your actual reality, mm-hmm. and you think in different terms, you think at different speeds, you think in different ways than you would if we didn't have that. And so the transhumanist argument is that hum- human existence today because of technology is a completely different existence than it was a thousand mm-hmm. years ago. Right, right. Like we think differently, we act differently, we have different values because of this. Mm-hmm. Um, so my thing is, I-, I don't see that as a good thing. I see that as a scary thing. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I, I don't know what the solution is. Right. Yeah. I think I think as Christians, because we have the standard of Christ, it's going to be easier for us to figure out what the solution is. Not that not that it's easy, mm-hmm. but but we I mean, from the world's point of view, there's less of a reason for them to be scared and just a full acceptance of all of this. And so I'll say my last bit of piece here uh, with a verse and give you the reason why I'm reading this. Then I'll let you guys, if you have anything else to mm-hmm. say on the matter uh, as we finish up. But my sermons would be better if I used AI. They would be better uh, from a linguistic view. Um, it, yeah, I guess I'll just say like that. Like more way. polished. Uh, yeah, a more polished presentation is what I mean by mm. by better in that sense. Um, maybe my communication would be all of that. Um but again, I don't think it's biblical, and I, I'll read this uh, from 1 Corinthians, uh, starts off chapter 2. Uh, Paul says, and so it was with me, brothers, and he's referencing what he talks about in chapter 1, which is how um, it says not many of us uh, were wise by human standards, Not we weren't influential, we weren't noble birth. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. So he's saying, hey, that's how it was for me too. So when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ, Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Mm. And I think it's a reminder... Um, not to have some false sense of humility within myself, but um, I know I'm not the best preacher. I mean, you, you can go on YouTube and you can watch other preachers. And so why do we have hundreds of people that come here on a Sunday morning to hear me preach? I hope it's not because 
I can stand up there and say something eloquently that chat GPT could give me Mm -hmm. some bigger words than I normally use maybe. Uh, But hopefully they see the Holy spirit. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they see the community that we talked about before and in my God given image and they live that out in community with one another. Um, And we're just reminded that, you know, we're not, we're not trying to be something that even the apostle Paul wasn't Mm -hmm. uh, the best. And I think, I guess, I guess that's what I struggle with when some of the things that we talked about and, and it, it making us better producers. Mm-hmm. We're not, we're not just producers. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not meant to treat each other like producers. I've heard it said we're, we're human beings, not human doers. We're not just meant to do all the time. Mm-hmm. We're just meant to be and to dwell with God. And John 15, we abide in him and we just rest in him and so just all of that to remind ourselves, um, maybe in the world's eyes or, or ways that we would grade one another, mm-hmm. uh, we don't need to get A pluses all the time because then that just reduces us to a production line. Right. Um, but we're, because of what God says about us, we're a lot more than that. Mm-hmm. I mean, to the world, that's all the world has. The, all the world has to offer is is being a better doer and, yeah. and more production. So you get more money or you, you fit that goal or vision that you've had for your life. But for us, we have something different that we're attaining to. When I think what you just honed in on is the Christian ontology, mm-hmm. on, ontologically what it means to be a Christian. It means that we become lesser, so he becomes yeah, greater. absolutely. So if we're focusing on making ourselves greater through outside means of technology, then we are diminishing what it means to be Christian, mm-hmm. that we exalt our weaknesses because it exalts God's strengths and it exalts the Spirit's work. So ontologically, to go back to your question of what do we, you know, how should we live this out, I think we address our weaknesses. You know, be okay with not being completely polished or not Mm -hmm. um, having the newest gadget or, you know, sticking out your weakness a little bit more because that exalts God's strength. I think so teleologically what I was going to go, what I wanted to end with was our purpose in this life is to long for and exemplify and, and um, profess the next life because the new creation, the new heavens, the new earth, that's our home. Mm -hmm. And so transhumanism from a Christian perspective is ridiculous because no matter how great we get here, it's nothing compared to what our what we're promised. Yeah. And so yeah. our our teleological goal mm-hmm. and purpose is to long for the next life, which gets um, we get the picture of in, in Revelation twenty one, where he sees in this vision. He says, "Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth had passed away." And the sea was no more, which the sea represents chaos. So chaos and evil is no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity. He will live with them. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them and will be their God. And if you go on and on, it says there will be no more light because the glory of God will be their light. Mm-hmm. And so it's this full picture of God's dwelling with us. So our goal, our purpose is to become lesser so he becomes greater because in that we dwell with God mm-hmm. and we return to what it means to be his image bearers, to not try to place ourselves on par with God, but to simply be relational with God, yeah. to sit in his glory and, and to to bear that glory. Right. It's, good. Right. it's good. Matt, anything to, to wrap us up here? Yeah, no. I, the, the one thing, in, again, in doing uh, some research for this that I found that is like definitely we don't want to go there is in Germany, there is a AI church. It's, a, it's in a physical building, but the congregants go, and there's a giant screen on stage, and the the speaker, the I won't even call her a preacher, the speaker, the AI, AI generated person oh, on the what? screen. It's oh it's an AI generated person, wow. and the guy that controls it 
types in a prompt on what he wants the message to be about wow. for that day and boom there you go and it when it first started it gathered a lot of people um to see it just because it was something new and mm -hmm. like what is this and the overwhelming thought coming out of it was like no absolutely mm. not so yeah. there is hope you yeah. know um people realize the yeah. artificial nature of it. right right and and kind of what you were going back to jeff about community and everything like no matter how smart ai gets it is never going to be able to replace that community yeah. and that love and care that we have for mm -hmm. one another and I think we saw this more than ever, you know, in COVID when everyone was isolated, yeah. like the yearning just to be mm -hmm. around people. And, you know, it's it's going to go one way or another. And there's going to be some people that, you know, there's some people now that like have shut themselves off and don't want to be around people. But for the overwhelming majority, like I don't see AI ever replacing what we have yeah. humanly between yeah. each other yeah, yeah, the, for sure yeah the relationships and everything so it's a great conversation to have absolutely um, i'm a little bit more confused coming out of it than <laughs> i was going into it where i stand and transhumanism because i think transhumanism you can you can pick that apart to every nth degree and oh, say yeah. well i'm not going to do anything and to say that transhumanism isn't active is just to turn a blind eye to the modern world right, right and so the question isn't is transhumanism already present is how are we navigating that mm -hmm. as god's image bearers as as the representative of the ambassadors of, of right. christ to the world so right. and i i know we're trying to wrap up this podcast but this may open up a whole nother can of worms for you but so transhumanism is when anything is being used to better yourself essentially and is it is it to do so in order to the thing that pops into my mind like we use technology in sports mm -hmm. right they the the shoes for running yeah bigger faster stronger quicker right yeah. that is something that comes out of technology that makes you better so would that fall under transhumanism or in um it, it would a transhumanist would say that um, it would. What would Garrett but, Crawford say? Well, so I, the argument of transhumanism is that any technology that betters humanity mm -hmm. is a step towards the ultimate goal of posthumanism. Right, right. But I also see some of this as just being endowed with the wisdom of God mm -hmm. and the creativity of God. Uh, one of the other things, and there's a quote in the book, that's brought up is we have a creativity endowed on us through our creator, mm -hmm. but we also have a submission as God's image bears to him who created us. Mm -hmm. Transhumanism says we use that creativity to exalt ourselves, not to align ourselves under him. Right. And so I'm not like a someone that's going to say we got to throw out all technology uh -huh. like an Anabaptist or an, an Amish mm -hmm. you know person um but I, I think we need to tread lightly over mm -hmm. it it's it's a slippery slope to pull us away from from the Imago Dei um I think a better example of like the sports mm -hmm. would be like a transhumanist would say that uh, steroids and performance enhancing drugs shouldn't be illegal because that's the goal. Mm -hmm. We want to be better. Right. Um, so, you know. I, yeah. yeah. And to your point, too, that that showing, because these people that God created that have been given the ability and talents to come up with this yeah. stuff using technology, you know, I, I think, again, it goes back to the very beginning, your heart and the reason why you're doing it. If you're doing it, like, I'm a sign creator, right? Yeah. I use technology all the time. I use computers all the time. But in everything I do, mm -hmm. like, I want to be honoring God with it, yeah. even uh, in a sign. So I think it, it goes back to what you personally are looking for. If you're looking to prop yourself up better and say, look how good I am, then yeah, obviously not. Well, I think a thought experiment is... If humanity hadn't fallen, would mm -hmm. we still have technology? Hmm. Something to think about. Well, you know, in, in all of this, uh, 
we want to understand, like Matt's been saying, we have technology all around us, but we also want to be hesitant knowing that we're honoring God in all things. And and we can do that differently depending yeah. on, you know, our type of work and how we're involved with things. And so we just hope that as you think about these things with the biblical worldview that um, you'd seek God's wisdom and discernment and uh, maybe others. Maybe you do come and talk to one of us here at NCC uh, to better understand maybe how your workplace uses AI and if you feel okay with that and and different things like that. We'd love to continue this conversation with anybody that might be interested. Uh, but hopefully we gave you some things to chew on, hopefully some things to research and think about as you discern uh, where God is is directing you. Maybe this isn't something you've faced at all, and it's just been an introductory for uh, for you with AI and some new tech technology that thank you for tuning in to ncc as always we thank you so much for listening to another if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast we encourage you to share this with your friends and family (laughs) no i said unplugged no you did ncc unplugged is available on all major podcast platforms (laughs) (laughs) we will watch it again experiencing norwin christian church firsthand as always we really appreciate you listening to another episode of ncc unplugged and we have an engaging classes available so much. for all ages, ensuring there's something meaningful for everyone in our church community. For more information about NCC or any other inquiries, visit norwinchristianchurch.com 